Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the organizers once again. This is very fruitful and interesting. Um, interesting for me was also the previous presentation because I am going to talk about, uh, in a way, the same topic but uh, from a different angle. The Maria's talk also uh, taught me how we are really products of our environment because at my school um, the problem is rather not being enough of a Buddhist. <laughs> um, so the, the topic of my talk is teaching wisdom and um, it has a question mark because I am um, not 100% sure about the, um, what I'm going to present and want to put it out uh, here for a discussion. Um, because my question is, can we teach wisdom in academic Buddhist studies classes or should we even try? So I teach also, like Philip, at the Rangjung Yeshi Institute in Bauda, Kathmandu. And as we heard, that is a, an institute that combines uh, two academic approaches. On the one hand, it's part of Kathmandu University, which has a BA program and an MA program in Buddhist studies um, along American University standards. That's how we grade and, and so on. But you know, the institute is also located um, on the premises of the monastery, Kanung Shedrubling, and um, that means, um, among other things, that the monks of the monastery participate as instructors at the university. So every semester there are at least four philosophy classes that are um, being taught by an educated Tibetan monk scholar in Tibetan language. Two of these classes are with translators, two without, which means that our students, um, some of our students, are at the level of following philosophy classes in, in Tibetan. Um, these classes by the Tibetan monks, they are um, taught according to Tibetan pedagogical models. They are understood, and their purpose, their frame is the Mahayana aspiration of attaining Buddhahood. So these teachers are expected to teach wisdom. That is a type of knowledge that aims at answering the most profound questions of our being, mm -hmm. questions of the meaning of life in the face of our fragile impermanence, questions are about developing the highest potential of our human nature, which of course the Buddhists call Buddhahood. For us teachers in the Western academic classes, the situation is not as clear. Yeah? On the one hand, all of us are faculty members of the Rangjung Yeshe Institute, which we call in short RYI. Um, and we have um, expressed in our talks among ourselves about our teaching philosophy that we have the aspiration that our courses have transformative effects on our students. But then on the other hand, our task is to adhere to the standards of um, secular academia. We introduce the students to the various methodologies of religious studies, and that includes the uncomfortable historical and critical perspectives that contradict the faith traditions. Mm -hmm. So there are some students at, at our school that think that these academic classes, they are uh, superfluous and even annoying <laughs> um, because they do not um, see a, a deeper purpose in, in those classes other than that they're necessary to get the degree. <laughs> um, and when I started teaching university classes and I started to learn teaching, and that was here in Canada at McGill University, I learned by observing the senior professors and I saw that they all keep out their beliefs out of the classroom. Questions of personal faith that were never discussed. Per, uh, spiritual practice was not discussed. Maybe you are, were an exception. <laughs> <laughs> I, I once taught a class that was guided by Vanessa and, um, and co-taught. So, but you will talk about that. That was a different dynamic. But <laughs> um, so... Um, coming out of McGill, of course, I, I've tried to emulate these examples. I also discovered, actually, that in a way I feel, I felt, feel most comfortable when I teach something that I've already seen. It feels like it has an authority. Mm -hmm. Inventing something new, trying out something new, um, feels a lot more scary, at least the first time. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I so I try to emulate those examples and. Um, I often felt like missing out on a precious opportunity. 
At a time where our societies face multiple pro problems such as social inequality and the, we heard it, the consequences, we know it, of climate change, terrorism and so on, it seems counterintuitive to teach wisdom traditions such as Buddhism in a university setting without the demand that those teachings bring forth wisdom in our students. Mm -hmm. Simply producing religious literacy and knowledge about Buddhist traditions is a rather mediocre objective when the world is in need of citizens and leaders that are not only intelligent, innovative and brave, but also compassionate and caring for other beings' welfare, irrespective of its in-group, out-group categories based on race and gender, religion and all of that. Um, besides, we take for granted that the research in, in other areas, like in the natural sciences, produce concrete and applicable solutions to real-life problems. So why do we not hold religious studies, research and education to those same standards? Yeah, I mean, we want medical research to result in vaccines that actually protect. We want engineering research to produce machines that function, psychological research to produce a set of therapies that heal. Only for religion, then it seems enough to observe from a distance. Why, why is that? I mean, you could argue, of course, that um, that part has to be done in theological seminars. Um, but in Buddhism, so far, we don't have those here, at least. Anyway, um, so many students enroll um, at the Rangjun Yeshe Institute, we heard it already, with this expectation to find keys for answering fundamental questions about the meaning and purpose of life. And yet, the academic classroom is supposed to be kind of a closed secular space, strictly avoiding religious practice and experience. But then how do we address the student's expectation to receive transformative knowledge at the university while um, preserving the standards of, of secular academia. Um, so, in other words, um, if, we, if, if I want to explore how to, um, how to teach wisdom, then, of course, my first question is, what do we mean by wisdom? What wisdom are we talking about? Throughout history, wisdom has been contemplated by philosophers, theologians, meditation masters, um, all along human history. In the recent years, wisdom has been scientifically researched in the field of psychology and apparently that much more than in the departments of philosophy or religious studies. So there are researchers that came out, um, for example, um, the psy psychologist, German psychologist Paul Baltes, um, founder of the Wisdom Project at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, um, or the American sociologist Monica Ardelt, they came up with some working definitions of wisdom. So Paul Baltes, for example, defines wisdom as the knowledge and behavior that reflects a high degree of the human condition, deep insight into the priorities of life, as well as the ways by which to live a good life. He says, a wise person is able to integrate and coordinate the intellectual, the emotional, the motivational, and the interpersonal dimensions of life, and to do this in a way that the welfare of humankind is the primary criterion. Yeah? The welfare of humankind is, is the consequence aimed at. So while Paul Baltus' explanation has more this outcome um, of our decisions in his definition, Monica Ardold, professor of sociology at the University of Florida, defines wisdom as a personality characteristic. Mm. A person is wise if she has certain cognitive, reflective, and effective qualities. So in these definitions, we can see that all has to do with practical life skills, with personal growth. Um, wisdom is developmental, takes time, takes guidance, and experience. And while I think that it's certainly desirable to teach our students to behave wisely in life, um, these definitions here that I gave are actually not what Buddhist masters have in mind when talking about wisdom. Important uh, Tibetan teachers, important for our school at Zhangdu Yeshe at least, um, like Zongza Kenzi Rinpoche or Chukinima Rinpoche, that is the spiritual head of Kanin Shedugling and also of the 
um, University of, of our Buddhist Studies Department, they emphasize that the crucial aspect that distinguishes Buddhism from all other wisdom traditions is the philosophy of no self and emptiness. During a recent vis visit that uh, Dongza Kenzi Rinpoche um, gave to the Rangjun Yeshe Institute, he emphasized that the one thing that differentiates Buddhist philosophy from all other wisdom traditions is the wisdom of no self, emptiness and non-duality. And he told the students, that is what you have to learn. Chukinima Rinpoche, he regularly refers to the ideal um, of what, to, to an ideal coming out of the studies, is the scholar-practitioner, and that is a person, as he defines it, uh, a person who embodies karuna shunyata, that means compassion and the realization of wisdom. So this is a different approach. Yeah? What do we do with this <clears throat> wisdom of uh, no self and emptiness? In, in the light of that, then uh, these Tibetan teachers and others, of course, then they criticized this recent secularization frenzy of Buddhist meditation practices. Mm -hmm. Um, as we have discussed this, this morning, um, that uh, bracket exactly this important point of Buddhist philosophy, which is no self, um, emptiness, and non-duality. I'm kind of putting them together. They overlap. Of course, the subtleties are different. Um, actually, this, uh, these topics were um, what initially attracted me to Buddhism because I, it, I was just so puzzled by it. Yeah? It didn't make sense. It triggered my curiosity. So the question um, that I raised was whether the academic classes that I was teaching, that I am still teaching, could contribute in any way to an understanding of no self and emptiness. And my reflections brought me to the idea that, of course, besides teaching the reflections, the logic of Nagarjuna that um, also explains, that is the traditional explanation of how we understand um, emptiness and um, the teachings of other philosophers, my reflections brought me um, to a possible approach to no self through patterns of pedagogy. And um, in order to explain what I mean with that, I want to talk a little bit about the summer course that we have at the Rangjung Yeshe Institute. Because I, I, I saw that in, in this course, these patterns of pedagogy come out in, in a very successful way, I think. So this... Um, uh, summer course um, is a two-month course that consists of three classes that run in parallel for six weeks, namely a traditional class taught by a Tibetan scholar on the topic of Buddhist philosophy, philosophy and ethics and so on. That is one. The second is an academic class that contextualizes and contributes critical views on the Buddhist intellectual history. The third is a meditation class that gives access to experiential knowledge. And after six weeks of that, then um, follows a 10-day retreat in a monastic setting near a cave of Guru Rinpoche in Nepal. And that makes up then the two months. The, the course design has been successfully Im implemented for many years at the Kathmandu University Center of Buddhist Studies. I only came into it last year to teach it for the first time. It is very successful in that it creates an environment in which students constantly alternate between uh, different poles, between the traditional Tibetan Buddhist and the Western um, academic scholarship poles, between cognitive learning and contemplative learning, between um, theoretical and embodied applications of learned insight. And they do this at um, rapid succession. They're exposed to all these different styles, uh, one after the other. And that, I think, I could, I could see that, has an important impact on the learning experience of the students. So in one and the same morning, students may be exposed to the idea that, um, on the one hand, sutras are the words of the Buddha. Then they hear about Johannes Bronkhorst's thesis that sutras cannot have been written by or spoken by the Buddha nor even by his close followers. But then they learn um, meditation techniques that are based on these sutras. Yeah. <laughs> or when it comes to uh, Vajrayana, then they learn that the, these wrathful expressions of Buddhahood, that they might be the product of um, 
societal and cultural situation in the 6th century of India, um, that it was actually royal funding by warring kings who desired strong protection um, that influenced the, de- in, uh, the evolution of Buddhism in the way of bringing out these tantric uh, forms of meditation with uh, wrathful deities and so on. Um, they, they learned that uh, Tantra overthrows the monastic ideas of renunciation, but is the quickest path to Buddhahood. When it comes th- to Mahayana uh, teachings, they learn compassion is the core of Mahayana. Then in the academic class, they learn that the secularization of compassion training that is happening right now in North America actually was unknowingly prepared by Tibetan Buddhist masters of the 13th century by their very important um, innovations in compassion meditation and mind training. So students get introduced to the interdependence between all these different aspects um, of Buddhist history. And, well, they come with, uh, for the most part, very sincere aspirations um, to learn about that, and many of them um, are puzzled by all these contradictions. Some even are put into something like an existential crisis. Um, So we had uh, students ordained, we have ordained students in our classes. Um, When they heard, um, when they read in the Lotus Sutra that the Buddha said that a certain amount of his students were too arrogant to listen, these Shravakas, too arrogant to listen to the teachings and walked out of the um, teaching settings, they, they came up with all kinds of explanations why and said, well, I have gone out of the teaching because my stomach was upset and maybe that was <laughs> what was happening there. It sounds laughable, but you can see it is really kind of putting it together and not um, making it fall apart what they had reified in a, in a way and, and what was, is important to their lives. Yeah? Um, in the summer course... Um, most of our students come from abroad. The, the demographic is a little different than the normal semesters. So there, are, uh, we have a lot of students with um, the curiosity um, for wisdom, for dealing with real-life problems. Maybe they are coming to our university because um, they didn't want to do the simple mindfulness thing at their university, but going for the authentic thing. <laughs> anyway, they come and... Um, then they have so much enthusiasm, yeah? five hours of class and meditation each day, and then on top of it, they seek out people with whom they can talk um, and see how, how much renunciation um, <coughs> with life enjoyment can be combined so that you can still be a Buddhist. And, and they're really um, um, grappling with the possibilities that the Buddhist path offers. Um, there was one student who, who had been very successful in business, but then had at early age um, experienced sudden failure. And so um, he came to the Buddhist classes with really um, real life questions to him that he wanted to have answered. Some students um, come out and are disappointed. They say, this is relativism, yeah? Anything, these Buddhists say anything in the opposite, so everything seems to be right, and I was looking for, for, you know, answers. So, in these situations, I don't see my role um, as somebody to relieve the students of their feeling of discomfort and uncertainty, but um, to accompany them to this pro- uh, through this process of losing ground. And in the summer course, I thought this was particularly successful uh, setup for this dynamic because there was no escape from the dynamic of learning, questioning, introspection. Um, and as I said, through, through this um, rapid succession between these different standpoints, there was no way of holding on to any of those. So um, you might think that, anyway, this is what you're doing already in your class. <laughs> I want to uh, then come to a second aspect that I think is important, which is that we have to point out that this is happening um, in order to um, use this confusing information. And for that, I learned from another professor, John McCransky, who came to our university to teach um, secular compassion training. And I noticed that he um, applied the same idea. He guided the classroom through various exercises um, in which he asked the students to, in order now for for the purpose of learning uh, compassion, to first remember a situation in which they had been cared for. 
and then to identify with this feeling and really go into the memory of, of, um, of the situation, identify with it. Then he asked, um, he gave some explanations, then he asked to remember a situation where we have been cared for by others and again identify and embody that feeling. Then he asked um, to pay attention to different kind of thoughts and memories that came up while trying to relive these moments and said, um, was there um, fear? Did you feel annoyed? And each of these mind states he pointed out as being different selves in what we think is one personal self. And mm -hmm. by that he, he introduced um, the students to this idea that um, we cannot find one solid permanent self. And we have all heard about this, but the way he did it um, by really um, making it a con contemplative exercise um, with an embodied emotional feeling, um, I think opened some doors in the, the audience to get um, a personal experience of what could be meant by this abstract idea of no self. And in a way, we could say it is a low-level approach to no self and emptiness that goes much further. But um, I do think it is an interesting um, entryway of making sense of that. So as a, as a conclusion, um, I want to come back to that initial question that I had of teaching academic Buddhist studies classes in a way that enhances the student's wisdom, especially this wisdom of no self put forward in, in Buddhism. And um, what I suggested is um, that by paying attention to the patterns of pedagogy, um, in certain ways we can apply a principle of no self rather than teaching it theoretically, or maybe in addition to <coughs> teaching it theoretically if the topic of our class is Buddhist philosophy. And the second point is, of course, this in incorporation of periods of introspection as a means to point students to the dynamics of this pedagogy. Um, that helps to uh, students to learn in habit opposite sides of the polarity, which I think is a very important point because it questions um, our way of thinking, the students' way of thinking, um, of categorizing the world into poles of self and other, good and bad, sacred and profane, in-group and out-group, and so on. It is like um, the basis and the stepping stone to talk about bias, um, bias of which um, nobody really can escape. There's an, an interesting study by Harvard University. There they also have um, opened up a, a website where we can test our bias um, by doing little exercises. And... Um, hopefully finding out that the, the biases of which we think we are free, <laughs> that actually they are deep-seated. Yeah? So um, these are um, important discoveries because, um, as we've heard from, from Buddhism or own experience and reflection, bias is at the, um, at the root of aggression, um, at the root of wrong views. So these are important things that ca can and should be learned also in Buddhist studies classes. And... Um, with this, I want to open it up for a discussion, what you think about it, and maybe you have um, experienced and tried out similar um, techniques or reflections in your own classes. Thank you.